Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, say how much I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today. Uh, I'm talking about the essence of the survival uh, Jewish doctors in Auschwitz. Um, it's a s subject that I found uh, has not been researched uh, before and I found it very interesting. Um, I'd just uh, first um, go through the uh, the people that uh, the number of uh, people in the cohort that I looked at and there were 68 doctors um, that I identified um, at Auschwitz that survived, 24 Jewish doctors that uh, were the centre of my the research and I included obviously men and women. I also researched non-medical survivors um, and in interviewed uh, survivors and I also looked at survi um, survivors of conflict other than Auschwitz other than Auschwitz um, and that was Vietna Vietna Vietnam uh, uh, POWs and uh, Iranian uh, uh, hostages over quite a, quite a long period that they were held in captivity. Um, these are 22 of the doctors that uh, I researched and if you, in, in the book that I've written, uh, there's uh, uh, six doctors there that I did a very comprehensive uh, um, uh, uh, biographies on, and um, but I, I reference all of those doctors in uh, in in my study. That's uh, uh, Gisela Pearl, um, second from right. That's with her family, her mother, her brother, and father. And what I want to do is just quickly go through. Um, and as a case study of Gazella Pearl, <coughs> she was born in 1892 in Saget. Um, she graduated in medicine. The family came from a um, quite a successful and privileged family. Um, she was, uh, her father was quite strict. Uh, she, he demanded that uh, they have a good education. Um, th they were, um, uh, uh, lived in a, a Jewish environment um, and an extended family. Uh, she got married in, in the 20s. Um, she had two children, um, Helen and Ella, uh, sorry, Imra, Imri and, and Ella, and everything was going quite well until the beginning of 1944. Um, they lost everything uh, and they went to a, a ghetto in uh, in Saget and then to a transit uh, station which was a school in uh, Solomon Street and uh, sent to, uh, from there sent to Auschwitz. Um, when they got to Auschwitz, uh, the whole family uh, went to, uh, to the gas chambers or were executed in some form or other. Um, Gazelle Pearl, she went into Birkenau and um, three, uh, three sp specific things happened to her uh, that uh, sent her to a point of uh, despair and suicide. And both times was to do with Mengele. Um, he asked her uh, or told her to quieten some he hysterical women, um, told them if she quietened them, they would be they would be, uh, yeah, they would be saved and um, she did so and uh, they were then put on a truck and sent to the gas chamber. The second time it happened to uh, pregnant women and uh, she did what she was told to save her own life and the pregnant women were sent to the gas chamber. The third time she was uh, looking for... Um, had to get shoelaces, which if she didn't get shoelaces, it was a death sentence. Um, she went to the latrine with her bread to bargain, and the, the prisoner, a Jewish prisoner, demanded sex, and uh, so she had to have sex with 
with the prisoner in not very healthy conditions. Um, this situation drove her to s attempt suicide. Um, and I've shown this because of the conditions that she, she went through. Um, that, and all pr obviously all prisoners did in that. Um, so what prisoners such as uh, uh, Pearl and other doctors I wrote, I wrote about, uh, 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 they had to go through these, these uh, physical, mental and emotional conditions. Unlike um, other prisoners that survived for one year or two years um, in the administration or as a cook, um, as a, even as a capo, uh, these doctors were in the midst of everyday life of suffering um, and, and, and making these decisions. She, she uh, worked in the hospital, she worked in the infirmaries, so she was a harbinger of death. Um, she was in selections, she participated in sending Jews to their death. Um, she participated in deciding who was going to live or die uh, with the particular uh, pills, medicines. She uh, participated, um, like the other doctors, um, in, in life and death. She was the, the person, she was part of the machinery of, of the executions. And that's what she had to live with and that's what the doctors had to live with. Um, my question was, if you look, it, my question was how did Gazelle Pearl live in Birkenau where the average prisoner lived for 12 to 15 weeks and she lived for nearly 12 months in Birkenau, in the worst camp, arguably, uh, in uh, Hitler's uh, empire. How did doctors, um, the average doctor I found out of that cohort lived an average of 20 months. And most of them lived in and worked in Birkenau and the 50 labor camps that um, they were sent to. There's been two, server, two, two research, uh, um, research samples taken, uh, one by Jenny uh, Golden, Goldenberg in America, I can't remember the second name, but they asked quite a number of, uh, their, their sample was qu quite large, uh, they asked uh, survivors how did they survive. Um, it was a general uh, survey um, and 50% of them said it was luck, it was God or it was a miracle how they survived. Uh, very few said it was because I was resilient, because I was determined, because I had a good job, etc. Um, I don't believe that survival for 20 months or 12 months was one dimensional. I believe that it was, was, it was multi-dimensional, it was complex, uh, it was multi-layered. Um, and that's why, for, you know, the average prisoner lasted for 12 or 15 weeks and the, the average Jewish doctor in my cohort lasted for uh, uh, 20 months. And the, the um, chart that I showed before with all the doctors, it was the, the date that they came in to the camp and, and the date that they finished the death march. Um, and that was taken from, uh, from Auschwitz and then ITS. Um, I believe that, that I, I, I did a co construct and it was uh, based on a foundation of the will to live. And <clears throat> these doctors had an overwhelming will to live. Um, 
every time a train came into Auschwitz, on my, my research, almost as soon as they got into the camp, the labour camp, many, many prisoners lost the will to live for a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons were they were separated from their family and they went through a progress, which I, process which I haven't got time to explain, but it was something called ambiguous loss. And, and that sent them through losing their family into despair and many into suicide. But a certain number had a will to live. And on that foundation, I built three pillars. And the pillars were, <coughs> the first pillar was the status of the prisoner. And he was a, a privileged prisoner. You either were a privileged prisoner or you were a, a prominent. <coughs> and a privileged prisoner had the essentials of food, had, a, had an identity. He had a number, or she had a number, but they had an identity because they were a doctor, they wore a coat, they were different. Uh, they had relationships. Um, if, you, if you read jo Senator John McCain, who was in a, a, a windowless cell for two years, um, he maintained that what saved him was relationships. And it, his relationship was knocking on a window on the the door on the wall um, with signals with the guy next door. For two years he had that relationship and seeing prisoners go to the, the, the toilet or whatever and seeing the guard. But relationships he said saved his life. Um, and those, that pillar of status as long as they had clothing and food and relationships and some type of communication. The second pillar I built was one of personal trays. And prisoners didn't arrive in Auschwitz um, and immediately become resilient and immediately become determined or be mature and, and, and insightful and have these characteristics. They didn't immediately have them. If you look at the, the biographies that I've done, you'll find that it was a process of nature and nurture, that these prisoners, the doctors in my cohort had, if you go from their early, early life, they, 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 they gained through a process resilience. And if you look at the, if you, the interviews I had with psychologists and psychiatrists and, and, and psychoanalysis and uh, the reading that I did and the research I did is that a lot of resilience uh, is built from a family very early in life. And if you read the, bi uh, the biographies, every one of these doctors that I've studied, maybe not everyone, but the vast majority came from a very supportive, loving uh, family and extended family. And, and um, I could tell you a lot of stories uh, about what happened in the various families over the four years that I did the research. The final one is, is defence mechanisms. <coughs> and defence mechanisms are, are uh, some psychiatrists say there's not much difference between personal traits and defence mechanisms. And, uh, but defence mechanisms are, are a protection. Uh, it's it's um, Two minutes, okay. So, from that is that every, that the, um, to, to survive extreme adversity, every one of them have got to work in concert. Every, the three of them have got to work in concert. And if any of them are missing, uh, if you've got needs, you've got the will to live, you've got the defence mechanism, but you, ha you, you lose the personal traits, you lose resilience, you lose coping skills, you, you will not be able to cope and you could end up a Muslim or uh, not cope. So if you look at Gazelle, Pearl, that's what happened to her. Um, she worked in, in Birkenau, she received additional 
food, etc. She was resilient and determined and she adopted a cause which was saving pregnant women, which became a, pa a passion and then a, an obsession. And that gave her meaning in life while she was in an extermination camp. And that was important for her to continue living that meaning in life and gave her the will to live. And that's her survival after the Holocaust, which gave her more meaning to live. Thanks very much.